lifting up Jesus and opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching Morial TV. My announcement today marks the beginning of a new approach to conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. In 1995, Congress adopted the Jerusalem Embassy Act, urging the federal government to relocate the American Embassy to Jerusalem and to recognize that that city, and so importantly, is Israel's capital. This act passed Congress by an overwhelming bipartisan majority and was reaffirmed by unanimous vote of the Senate only six months ago. Yet for over 20 years, every previous American president has exercised the law's waiver, refusing to move the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem or to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital city. Presidents issued these waivers under the belief that delaying the recognition of Jerusalem would advance the cause of peace. Some say they lacked courage, but they made their best judgments based on facts as they understood them at the time. Nevertheless, the record is in. After more than two decades of waivers, we are no closer to a lasting peace agreement between Israel and the Palestinians. It would be folly to assume that repeating the exact same formula would now produce a different or better result. Therefore, I have determined that it is time to officially recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. While previous presidents have made this a major campaign promise, they failed to deliver. Today, I am delivering. I've judged this course of action to be in the best interests of the United States of America and the pursuit of peace between Israel and the Palestinians. This is a long overdue step to advance the peace process and to work towards a lasting agreement. Israel is a sovereign nation with the right, like every other sovereign nation, to determine its own capital. Acknowledging this is a fact is a necessary condition for achieving peace. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here with James Jacob Prash, live in Singapore, and this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings, dear friends, and greetings in Jesus, and what a week this has been. This week, obviously, we're going to focus on, on one central issue, the timely and courageous announcement of the Trump administration that the United States has formally recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Jerusalem, and he is inaugurating plans to transition the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The ramifications of this are going to be stupendous in a number of areas. Not least of which, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Despite the opposition coming against Mr. Trump from so many sources and quarters, from fake news, from out lies, from the left, from Antifa, expect God to bless Mr. Trump's administration. Expect God to bless the United States because of what he's done. He is reversing the curse brought on America by Barack Obama, when Barack Obama knifed both Israel in the back and betrayed America to Iran. It, additionally, Obama's lobbying to have other nations, including Great Britain and, North, and New Zealand, to vote against Israel, 
with UNESCO to absolutely be way to nothingness any legitimate Israeli claim to Jerusalem and its holy sites, including the Kotel and Wailing Wall. Barack Obama betrayed the interests of America, he betrayed Israel, he betrayed the naive Jewish American community who voted for him by a margin of 78% in his first election. Thank God Mr. Trump has done what he's done. This shows the foolishness of the American Jewish community's left-leaning politics for what it is, but it also demonstrates the influence of the prayers of evangelical America. But let's look at this intact. The opposition predictably is coming, coming from a number of sources. Certainly the Arab world and the Arab League, as well as the Palestinian Authority. But this, of course, is utter, utter hypocrisy and has no, no factual merit. In actual fact, in all surveys, only 25% of the Arabs in Gaza under Hamas see the capital of Jerusalem as a major issue. Only 12%, 12% of the West Bank Arabs see it as a major issue. So while the apologists for terror, while the apologists for terror, Mr. Abbas of the Palestinian Authority, the Arab parent and uh, de facto of the late terrorist Yasser Arafat, has celebrated the blood of all of the so-called Islamic martyrs who died for Jerusalem, only 12% of the Arabs on the West Bank even see it as a major issue. It is being brewed up for political propaganda purposes by radical Islam and by the Palestinian Authority. Predictably, the European Union, as well as Theresa May, who has no business being Prime Minister of Great Britain after the nation voted for Brexit, is opposing Mr. Trump's action. The same as last week, she opposed Mr. Trump's action showing films of radical Islamic behavior in Britain and in Europe. This, this is Theresa May. She, of course, is being kept in check by the Ulster parties who are unionists who are preventing her from doing what she otherwise would, selling Britain down the river and betraying the Brexit vote. She's unable to do that, but there's also a considerable amount of sympathy for Israel among Northern Irish Protestants who vote for the Unionist parties. Hence, her hands are fortunately tied. Let's hope that her hands are tied and she's removed from number 10. She should not be there after the nation democratically voted for Brexit. There should be a Brexit prime minister. We spoke about this before. Nonetheless, she's not having her way. Mr. Trump doesn't care what she says, neither does he care what the governments of France and other European countries say. Notably and commendably, the government of the Czech Republic has also recognized Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, specifically West Jerusalem. But let's understand further the hypocrisy of the opposition. Nowhere is the hypocrisy of the opposition more astounding than in certain so-called churches based in Jerusalem and their patriarchates and bishops. Given the fact that these are the same churches and denominations being driven out, out of the Middle East, in nation after nation, being targeted in Iraq, Syria, and elsewhere, you would think that they would have a sympathy towards Israel, the one nation that protects their religious freedom. Nonetheless, again, predictably, the patriarchs of the Eastern Church, of the Greek, Syrian, and Armenian Church, the Coptic Church, who suffers terrible in Egypt, the Ethiopian Coptic Church, the Roman Catholic Franciscan Order, the Melachite Catholic Church, and the Maronites of all people, giving the fact that so many of the Phalangists from Lebanon, who Israel absorbed as refugees, are Maronites, uh, as well as the Episcopals and Lutheran Protestants. Again, these people are largely not believers, they're not born again, have all aligned themselves as signatory in a document against Mr. Trump's action. Also, predictably, the present Pope, the uh, Pope who refused to meet with the families of children victimized by pedophiles when he was the Cardinal and Archbishop in Buenos Aires before becoming Pope, has denounced Mr. Trump's action, as if American foreign policy should be made in the Vatican uh, instead of in Washington. So some controversy today from Pope Francis that has people sort of 
turning uh, their heads a little bit on this one. The leader of the Catholic Church suggesting that the Lord's Prayer, the best known prayer in Christianity, which is prayed by not thousands, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. but 2.2 billion people around the world, may undergo a little bit of an edit. Pope Francis authorizes Palestinian embassy at the Vatican as he threatens Trump on Jerusalem move. The developments came as Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas met with Pope Francis and inaugurated the Palestinian embassy to the Holy See. Abbas said he had only heard through news reports of the proposal by U.S. President-elect Donald Trump to move the embassy to Jerusalem. The Vatican stressed the sacred nature of Jerusalem on Saturday as the Palestinian leader warned that prospects for peace could suffer if the incoming Trump administration goes ahead with plans to move the U.S. Embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. The developments came as Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas met with Pope Francis and inaugurated the Palestinian Embassy to the Holy See. Abbas said he had only heard through news reports of the proposal by U.S. President-elect Donald Trump to move the embassy to Jerusalem. The Palestinians strongly oppose the embassy move, saying it would kill any hopes for negotiating an Israeli-Palestinian peace agreement and rile the region by undercutting Muslim and Christian claims to the holy city. We hope that this news is not true, because it is not encouraging and will disrupt and hinder the peace process he said. He urged Trump to open a dialogue with both Israelis and Palestinians. Trump hasn't yet laid out a clear Mideast policy, but has signaled he will be more sympathetic to Israel's hardline rights than previous administrations. In Paris on Sunday, the French government is hosting a Mideast peace conference attended by dozens of foreign ministers to show Trump's administration that most of the world wants a two-state solution for Israel and the Palestinians and is fed up with decades of conflict. The Vatican has long sought an internationally guaranteed status for Jerusalem that safeguards its sacred character. In its communique after the Abbas meeting, the Holy See didn't refer to Jerusalem by name but said during the talks emphasis was placed on the importance of safeguarding the sanctity of the holy places for believers of all three of the Abrahamic religions. During the meeting, Abbas presented Francis with gifts recalling Christianity's birthplace in the Holy Land, including a stone from the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem and documentation about the ongoing restoration of the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. After the papal meeting, Abbas formally inaugurated the new Palestinian embassy across the street from one of the main gates of Vatican City. He pulled back a curtain revealing a plaque and extended the Palestinian flag from a flagpole outside a window. The embassy, located in the same building as the embassies of Peru, Ecuador, and Burkina Faso, comes after recent accords in which the Vatican formally recognized the state of Palestine. This embassy is a place of pride for us and we hope all of the countries of the world will recognize the state of Palestine, because this recognition will bring us closer to the peace process, he said. But again, it's not getting much coverage and most Catholics don't pay attention to the Vatican anymore anyway, nor should they in view of the fact it is morally discredited. It has had its own political interests in Israel and in Jerusalem for centuries and it is simply be playing that long game. But the opposition is coming from there. Again, in light of the persecution that Christians have been experiencing in the last five to ten years particularly, with the Christian population of Arab countries in the Middle East being decimated by radical Islamic activity, you would think the sympathy would be with the Israelis who give them freedom. The power of anti-Semitism and Satan to unite people who don't even like each other, radical Muslims and nominal Christians, would remind one of the fact that the Sadducees and Pharisees did not like each other either, but they aligned themselves against Yeshua, Jesus, the Messiah. Again, the religious hypocrisy that knows no bounds is always alive and well in Israel, especially in Jerusalem. But let's recount even further the opposition that's taking place. It's not only from the EU, it's not only from the Vatican and from nominal churches. It's not only from the Arab world, it is coming from 
left wing Jewish quarters. Senator Bernie Sanders, true to form, nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn, has, of course, denounced it. Also, denouncing it has been Rabbi Rick Jacobs, who, who, although he accepts Jerusalem as Israel's capital, says that the embassy should be removed and it should only be recognized as the United, by the United States as the capital as part of some kind of a comprehensive settlement with the Muslims. Uh, there's nothing worse than, than a Meshumet. And, of course, to placate the left, we get the usual silence from Chuck Schumer and from Debbie Washerman Schultz and other left-wing American Jews and left-leaning American Jews who will say nothing to commend the president's action. It's all about politics and hypocrisy with such people. Uh, they do not reflect the values or the opinions of the electoral majority of Israelis. There is a growing movement of conservatism among Jews in America, and we have notable figures at the forefront of that, including David Horowitz and others, uh, certainly Mark Levin, Ben Shapiro. We will move the American embassy to the eternal capital of the Jewish people, Jerusalem. And the crowd war, uh, roared, but would it happen? Would, if he became president, would President Trump actually do this? Presidents well, before have said it. President looks like he's going to do it. I know. He's saying he's going to do it today at 1 o'clock. I think that makes Ben Shapiro pretty happy. He's the editor-in-chief of the Daily Wire, syndicated columnist and host of the Ben Shapiro Show. Ben, what, was your, what are your thoughts? When did you hear that he was going to do this? Oh, I had heard actually sort of off the radar last week, uh, and I'd kept it under wraps. So I was pretty excited about that. It's obviously an act of not only political bravery, but moral courage to move the, the embassy, but, but just to recognize Israel as Jerusalem is Israel's capital. The absurdity of the U.S. policy suggesting that Jerusalem was not Israel's capital has resulted in idiocies like the fact that my niece, who was born in Jerusalem, it says on her passport Jerusalem, and then it doesn't say which country she's from. Jerusalem is only important to the world because of Judaism. It's important to Christianity because it was first important to Judaism. It's important to Islam because it was first important to Judaism. Jerusalem is mentioned hundreds of times in the Jewish text. Jerusalem is in the, is in the Israeli national anthem. The culmination of Jewish history really was in 1967 with the recapture and the unification of, Judea, of Jerusalem under Judea rule. Uh, the freedom of Jerusalem was only assured, by the way, because of that Jewish rule. What, what President Trump is doing is not just a recognition of reality, it's also uh, an act of, of political usefulness, because all of the negotiations that have been happening for the last 20 years, for most of my lifetime, all of those negotiations have been preconditioned on stupidity, that Israel was going to give up its eternal capital, which is insane. I mean, in order to understand how dumb that is, you have to think that for Israel, Jerusalem is about a thousand times more important than Washington, D.C. is to the United States. I mean, the founders put Washington, D.C. on a swamp because they just wanted it to be not part of any state. The, the reason that Jerusalem is where it is is because the Bible says it is where it is. There's a religious adherence to Jerusalem that doesn't exist for normal capitals right. around the world. And for President Trump to recognize that this isn't going anywhere, that the freedom of Israel is, in, is just inherently connected with the freedom of Jerusalem, and that any negotiations that are to take place are going to have to be done by the Israelis themselves, and the Israelis are going to have to make decisions about what to do with their capital. Well, it's, it's a ground shift, and it's a recognition of a reality that's necessary in order for real peace to be achieved in the region, not based on right. false stupidities that have been promulgated for the last right, couple so, of decades. So they have six months to actually do it. Uh, they have a six-month waiver to actually do it. Monday was the deadline to actually make the announcement, so today we're going to get it today officially at 1 o'clock. But it will remain a divided city. That won't change. Does that bother you? Well, I mean, it will remain a divided city because the fact is that the, the authorities have basically allowed uh, terrorism to, to spread among the Palestinians, and East Jerusalem has largely been, been occupied by the same people who has been occupied poor for, for the last seven decades, namely uh, Muslim, Muslims who live there. Uh, that, that part of the city is very dangerous. It's, it's been very dangerous ever since I can remember long before I was born. Uh, the fact is that when I visited Israel for the first time when I was 16 years old, Israeli soldiers had to guard us as we came out of the tunnels under the Western Wall into East Jerusalem, which, again, the capital of Israel, if you are a Jew and you walk into East Jerusalem, your life is in danger. If you're an Arab and you walk into West Jerusalem, there's no problem at all, which signifies exactly why Jerusalem should be under Jewish control and not under Muslim control. But the traditional liberalism that's always defined and now plagues Jewish America is raising its ugly voice again and pouting against its own interests. Uh, Left-wing American Jews are sickening people. Christians 
who denounced President Trump's action in light of the persecution of Christians in the Muslim countries are sickening people. Europe, we expect to be sickening. What do you expect from the leaders of the EU or from Theresa May? And of course, what do we expect from the Vatican? However, Mr. Trump and Mr. Pence have kept their pledge. They are keeping it. We applaud them. We pray for them. God cannot lie. Genesis chapter 12, 1 to 3. I will bless Bless them who bless thee, and curse them who curse thee. This will not only stem the judgment that comes as a result of the cursing of Israel and of America by the corrupt Obama administration, but it will bring God's favor to the present American administration. We've asked people to continue to pray for the president. They have, and he has acted. It will be a good thing for Israel. And it will be a very good thing for America. Benjamin Netanyahu has, of course, applauded the actions of the president, saying he's doing something that no, no one else has had the courage to do for over 70 years. This is a historic day. Jerusalem has been the capital of the Jewish people for 3,000 years. It's been the capital of Israel for nearly 70 years. It was here that our temple stood, our kings ruled, our prophets preached. Jerusalem has been the focus of our hopes, our dreams, our prayers for three millennia. From every corner of the earth, our people yearn to return to Jerusalem, to touch its golden stones, to walk its hallowed streets. So it's rare to be able to speak of new and genuine milestones in the glorious history of this city. Yet today's pronouncement by President Trump is such an occasion. We're profoundly grateful for the president for his courageous and just decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel and to prepare for the opening of the U.S. Embassy here. This decision reflects the president's commitment to an ancient but enduring truth, to fulfilling his promises and to advancing peace. The president's decision is an important step towards peace. For there is no peace that doesn't include Jerusalem as the capital of the state of Israel. I call on all countries that seek peace to join the United States in recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital and to move their embassies here. I share President Trump's commitment to advancing peace between Israel and all of our neighbors, including the Palestinians. This has been our goal from Israel's first day. And we will continue to work with the president and his team to make that dream of peace come true. I also want to make clear, there will be no change whatsoever to the status quo at the holy sites. Israel will always ensure freedom of worship for Jews, Christians, and Muslims alike. President Trump, thank you for today's historic decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The Jewish people and the Jewish state will be forever grateful. In 1947, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution, not a legal document, but a political resolution. It has no basis in international law, stating that Jerusalem should be internationalized and not seen as the capital of any particular country. But this goes against not only Israeli Jewish nationalism, it goes against Palestinian Arab nationalism. Why would they not be objecting to Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state, that is East Jerusalem? Again, always two standards. But let's look at this even further and more closely. Prior to 1967, West Jerusalem was firmly, firmly in the hands of Israel. It was the capital of Israel. It's where the prime minister's main office was based. It was the seat of the Israeli Knesset, the parliament. It was there in the Supreme Court. It was based there and has been prior to 1967. Both locations for the embassy, one opposite the Gan Atzma'ut, the Independence Park, and the other one, a construction site near the German colony by the adjacent former um, 
Israeli, I'm sorry, adjacent to the former property surrounding the old railway station in Jerusalem, which is the other construction site, uh, are both firmly situated geographically in West Jerusalem. They've never been a matter of dissent among Europeans, among Arabs, among anybody. They're in West Jerusalem. The majority of Arabs in the West Bank and in Gaza don't care about the final status of Jerusalem, except the ones who are being stirred up by the Palestinian Authority, Mr. Abbas, and radicals, as well as by Hamas. Again, the left-wing media will not tell you this. It is just more hypocrisy, fake news, and editorialization of fact, fact instead of reporting the actual situation for what it is. Jerusalem was not of much interest as a religious site to Muslims before 1967, as we've said. Al-Quds is the term, and it's disputed by Islamic scholars that Al-Quds is even Jerusalem. Only says it three times in the Quran. But what is clear is that even after the defeat of the Crusades by Salah Hadin, the family of Salah Hadin negotiated and gave Jerusalem back to the West. They didn't even want to keep it as part of a treaty to get military aid from the West against their other enemies. The historical claims are ridiculous, as are the religious claims of Islam. The Al-Aqsa Mosque was left in disrepair for generations. Not until the Mufti, that is the Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, made it an issue uh, with the founding of the Jewish state, did it come to the forefront again. It simply was not something of which there was very much concern at all. Not much at all. It was the Mufti of Jerusalem who assassinated King Abdullah I, the great-grandfather of the present King of Jordan and the grandfather of the late King Hussein. This began to put Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Temple Mount back again on the, te on, on the agenda of political focus. Most of the propaganda today being disseminated by radical Islam is claiming that Al-Aqsa, that is the Temple Mount, and and the Mosque of Omar are under some threat, under some threat from the Israelis. When in fact, for generations, they themselves did not even care about it uh, until Ahij Amin al Husseini, the Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, attempted to make it an issue. But it was nothing. As we pointed out in the past, up until the 1970s, the Arabs of the West Bank were called Jordanians, not Palestinians, until the tooth fairy came and waved the magic wand and they went to dead Jordanians but woke up Palestinians. This is the reality of what's happening. Now let's understand the nature of the current Islamic claim to the Temple Mount and the Old City. As we've explained in the past, it's based on the Islamic doctrine of Dar al-Salam. Islam divides the whole world into Dar al-Salam, the world of Islam, and Dar al harb that which is conquered in Jihad holy war, violently, and that which needs to be. And it is the belief of Islam, or the claim of Islam, that once something has been conquered, it is given to them by Allah. This is called the Waf, the Waf. What you have today, and what the European powers are pandering to, what the Arab League is, of course, propagating, and what the American left is giving assent to, is simply fundamentalist Islamic radicalism, the teaching of the Waf, Dar al Islam. The claims are not based on history, not really on religion, and certainly not on archaeology. Their claims are based only on not a religious state of Jerusalem or the sanctity of the Al Aqsa Mosque, which they themselves negated for generations, but it's based on the doctrine of Dar al Islam. Allah gave this to us, therefore it rightfully belongs to us, and we demand that you pay respect to our religion. Well, that's what one is American regime and one American administration has done after another. 
especially those who are owned and operated by the Saudis, like the Bush administration, certainly Barack Obama, Jimmy Carter, another. The Clintons, another. Donald Trump has changed that. We thank God that he has. Now we look further at this. The U.S. recognition, again, has resulted in a call for three days of outrage, rioting, maybe terrorist attacks. And we know that the boycott and disinvestment and sanctions movement has not gained the power it is hoped to have, trying to misrepresent Israel's policies as a form of apartheid that took place in South Africa. It's simply not the reality. Most countries understand that Israel, no matter what they may think of its policies, is still has a democratically elected government, unlike the Arab nations largely that surround it. It still has the best human rights record, and it is a strong and an important technological base for the development of high tech. It is in the interest of many Western corporations and industries to keep research and development in Israel. Israel has invented its way into acceptance. It has forced people to accept it. This is the Jewish way of thinking. Israel began learning from the example of American Jews. When Jews first arrived in America, they were the victims of of anti-Semitism after the pogroms when they fled Russia. They were put into ghettos. They were confined to areas of the lower east side of Manhattan in certain places in Brooklyn. Not forcibly confined, but confined there by economic circumstances and by cultural differences when they mostly only spoke Yiddish and European languages. They were not accepted. There was an inherent anti-Semitism among many people, but by education and hard work, they be became accepted. They forced people to need them by the use of their brains, not by rioting or murdering or killing. Well, Israel is doing the same thing as a nation. It's emphasizing education, science, technology, and the values of pluralism. Despite our criticisms of the religious parties of Israel, most secular Israelis are westernized people who accept a democratic premise to government. They never denied self-determination to the Arabs. The Arabs have denied it to themselves because of the Islamic presence of the Palestinian Authority and Hamas and Hezbollah. Who killed Mr. Bashar Jimmy in Lebanon? Who killed Anwar Sadat? Who killed King Abdullah of Jordan? It was always radical Muslims murdering peaceful ones. Again, like the murder that took place two weeks ago in the Sinai of peaceful Ahmadis by the hands of radical Muslims. It is time for Israelis to deal with radical Muslims the way that radical Muslims deal with peaceful ones. No one likes the idea of genocide. I don't advocate genocide, certainly not as a believer in Jesus. But I do advocate self-defense. When Hamas raises its head, wipe them out. Wipe them off the face of the earth. The Palestinian Authority should not be seen as a negotiating partner. When they engage in apologetics for terror, they should become a legitimate military target. It's time to stop restricting Israel's ability to defend itself with political pressure. My prayer for Jew and Arab is that they come to know Jesus and be saved. I see no lasting peace in the Middle East for anyone until the Messiah is accepted. And until the Arabs turn from Islam and until the Jews accept what the Hebrew scriptures say about their Messiah, the prophecies that Yeshua fulfilled. I have no hatred for Muslims. I have a love for Muslims, but I have a, a hatred for Islam. My hatred for Islam is fueled by my love for Muslims, particularly its radical expression. And disdain for Talmudic Judaism is not anti-Semitic. My family are Jews. I'm philo-Semitic. But it is not right for the religious parties of Israel to have the kind of power and influence they have over the rest of 
the society, denying freedom of religion to other Jews. Now we've repeated this, and these things are all factors in what's tra transpired this week. Asaf Freed, one of the leaders of the United, and a spokesman and leader of the United Temple Mount movement, said that Mr. Trump's declaration that Jerusalem is the cap capital of Israel and his announcement of plans to relocate the embassy there is the next major step, more important, in fact, than the Bellflower Declaration in seeing the rebuilding of the temple. It may be. That doesn't mean it's not right to do, but ultimately it will come to that. The Shikutsa Meshra men will be set up. The Antichrist will deceive both Jew and Arab, and he will set up an image in the temple. As best I can see, that is both literal and figurative. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel, there will be a tribulational temple in Revelation chapter 11. But it's interesting that the United Temple movements are the ones who are now saying this. This has been quite a week. True to form, another critic of Mr. Trump's action has been, once more, Mr. Recep Erdogan, the dictator of Turkey, who's destroying Turkish democracy systematically, who's attempting to radicalize and Islamize the country. And it's time to stop giving in to the bullying of the Islamicists that every country they take over, like Albania, they don't let you be a Christian in it. They kill you or drive you out. See, they're not tolerant. They'd be like saying, let's go to New Guinea and ship 100 headhunters back to our neighborhood. And they go, oh, it's just their culture to headhunt. Let's let them do it. Trump declared Jerusalem capital of Israel, White House officials. Again, and the media keeps saying, when is he going to declare it? When is he going to declare it? He already declared in the campaign he was going to do it. And then he said two days ago, sometime in the next six months, we're going to move it. And he's going to officially announce it today. So there's the answer. So I've seen a lot of confusion out there. Of, Did he do it or didn't he do it? It's symbolic, ladies and gentlemen. And I, quite frankly, am sick and tired of just the Israel obsession. It's like the racism obsession in this country. When you look at actual statistics, we're one of the openest and freest countries in the world for people to be upwardly mobile. But you go to a college, you get indoctrinated, not on that, but on how bad the country is. Because again, the social engineers want to bring the nation down. It's that simple. And Ergon is running around the Middle East trying to stir up trouble and trying to parlay the Islamic threat into Europe to make Europe sue for peace to capitulate and accept completely open borders. He says, if you don't accept completely open borders with Turkey, I'll flood you. You already did. Albania wasn't Muslim just a few hundred years ago. Now it is. Now part of Serbia is. It's like tentacles taking over. If there was a Christian cult that was killing people and taking over, I, I, I'd be against it, or an agnostic cult. I mean, I want a reformation of Islam. I don't want to obsess over Islam all day. I was against those wars that we previously had because I knew it was actually there to stir it up, part of globalism. But now the deal's been made and Europe's been open and the Islamists are moving forward in their worldwide jihad and our response is being called a crusade when all it is is defensive. Even he has been forced to make some modifications. The mayor of Ankara, Turkey's capital, Mila Gokik, has been removed, even though Gokik was an ardent supporter of Mr. Erdogan. Gokik supported attacks on Israeli targets. He said that we will kill them and that we will use violence against the Israeli consulates and embassies in Turkey. However, he also said Israel is causing earthquakes in Turkey, that they have some kind of technology developed with the assistance of the United States that's causing earthquakes. He's actually, this is the mayor of the national capital of Ankara. Well, even Mr. Erdogan realized a crazy man cannot be the mayor of your nation's capital. He's not. Yet, Mr. Erdogan, of course, adds his voice to those who are denouncing the actions of Mr. Trump. Mr. Trump, you've kept your word. God will bless those who bless. 
you have blessed, while Obama cursed. I wait for the hand of God to raise against Obama as it's already come against him politically. He's an evil, evil man, a true instrument of Satan. Mr. Trump, you are not a believer as far as I am aware, but it is my sincere prayer that you will become a truly regenerate Christian like Mr. Pence. I thank you for what you've done. I pray for you and your family, and I pray for your administration. I don't always agree with you, but I always pray for you. And I would encourage all of our viewers to do the same. God bless and thank you. This is Jacob Prash coming to you this week in Prophecy from Singapore.